Krishna. Am I audible behind? You can hear me? Mm -hmm. You can hear me? Yes, Thank you. Yeah. So I'll speak today on the balancing of intensive intensity and sustainability in bhakti. And I'll talk about this in terms of something about his con history and what is known as Radhanath Maharaj has contributed to this. There is, let me start first with an incident from the Mahabharat, which describes the context sensitivity of instructions. Before the Kurukshetra war occurs, at that time, Vidura and many other sages come and try to persuade Duryodhana and Dhritarashtra to desist from the destructive war. And at one time over there, when Vidura tells, Arjuna has single-handedly in this very body gone to heaven. He has single-handedly defeated all the devatas at <coughs> Khandav. He has single-handedly defeated the demons who had defeated the gods while fighting the Nevat Kavachas. <coughs> so he says, there is no way you can fight and win against Arjuna. And Bhima is infuriated. He speaks on and on about the prowess of the Pandavas. And at that time, Dhritarashtra says that if it is the will of destiny that our dynasty be destroyed. That's what Rudra tells him that the whole dynasty will be destroyed if you don't stop this war. So if it is the will of destiny that our whole dynasty be destroyed, then who am I, a tiny mortal, to stop the will of almighty destiny? And at that time, Vidura cuts through this rationalization. Uh, and rationalization means somehow we reason to try to prove something wrong to be right. So rationalize is as two spellings. Rationalize, R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-I-Z-E, rationalize. It can also be rational lies. <laughs> <laughs> so when we use our rationality to not only speak lies to others, but to make ourselves believe those lies. So when Atharashtra is rationalizing like this, Vidura cuts through his rationalization and tells him, O king, it is the consequence of our actions that are determined by destiny, not our actions themselves. It is the consequences of our actions that are determined by destiny. If a student doesn't prepare for the exam and doesn't do well, student, the parents ask, why didn't you do well? My destiny. It is not your destiny. <laughs> it is your irresponsibility. It is the consequences of our actions that are determined by destiny. So he just cuts through his illusion and tells him it's your responsibility to stop Duryodhana. But somehow, Dhritarashtra doesn't understand, he doesn't listen. And the whole war gets over and Dhritarashtra is devastated. Because all his hundred sons are dead. At that time, when he is despondent completely, Vyasadeva comes to him. And Vyasadeva tells him that O king, do not lament. This war was the will of destiny. And through this war, the destructive elements, the demonic elements on the earth have been removed. And you are simply, all the Kauravas and all of you are simply the puppet in the hands of destiny for this plan to be executed. Now we may say here, the Vidura and the Trashtra are telling exactly the opposite things. Because Vidura is telling, it is your responsibility, not destiny. And the Trash is saying, it is destiny. So, are they contradicting each other? Not exactly. See, instruction has to serve a purpose. And, in general, whenever we give any instruction to anyone, the purpose has to be that that per per person should Choose a course of action that helps them come closer to Krishna. So when the Dhritarashtra was complacent 
and was uh, weak minded and he was letting his son go on the wrong course of action at that time vidura's purpose was take responsibility now so that was meant to make him take a dharmic course of action but once that incident is over now that war is over uh, his sons are dead now if he is constantly beating himself up oh you know why did this war happen why did my sons die why did i stop rudana maybe i could have done to stop so now all this lamentation will get him nowhere so now I tell him okay that chapter in your in your life is over move onwards so <clears throat> the purpose of the instruction has to be seen along with the instruction itself so before the incident take responsibility after the because you can do something to change it after the incident there is nothing you can do to change it so now just see it as a will of destiny and move on in life now krishna is so expert that sometimes he can bring good even out of the bad <clears throat> so once i gave a whole class analyzing various pastimes on the bhagavatam you know da when we say krishna is merciful or when krishna has his plan by which everything happens so if, if krishna's plan is for good then does krishna's plan include our mistakes also <laughs> so if i commit a mistake can i say my mistake is krishna's plan or is my mistake my responsibility my thoughtlessness well yes if i have made a mistake which i could have thought better and i could have avoided that my mistake is my mistake but still krishna's plan is not like a fixed action course krishna's plan is so dynamic that it can incorporate our mistakes into it and still manifest through that so krishna can bring good even out of the bad so draupadi in the akshay patra past time she somehow forgot to clean that pot fully and that's why a little shark was left on the pot and krishna used that little grain little food to fill the pots mouth some of all the sages so krishna can bring good even out of the bad so when we see the past okay what has happened is the will of destiny that is that is meant to okay the past is a closed chapter move on in life so when we understand the context of instructions then we can understand uh, why different instructions may be needed at different times without the context we may absolutize instructions which will be counterproductive if you see there's one one devotee was compiled a, a series of paper almost 25 instructions of shri prabhupada which are exactly opposite to each other one devotee writes to prabhupada and says is a is a he is unmarried he says prabhupada i am in trouble by sex desire so prabhupada says it is my standard instruct standing instruction to anyone if you are troubled by sex desire get married <coughs> then somebody else again writes to prabhupada i am in trouble prabhupada says you are being troubled everyone is troubled even brahma is troubled <laughs> <laughs> the only solution is tolerate <laughs> now which is the right course this is exactly opposite isn't it <laughs> but they are not opposite so prabhupad is a spiritual master who knows the level of the disciple and then according to the level of the disciple prabhupad is giving an instruction so the context is very important to make sense of any instruction and this context sensitivity is what we will be considering <clears throat> in understanding how is con emerge at a particular time and what is required for the sustenance of the krishna consciousness movement into the future generations shri prabhupad came to america by krishna's arrangement at a extremely unusual time there was a time of immense material prosperity and immense material frustration the hippies they lived they grew up in a generation where all the things that the previous generations dreamt about the the great good american dream good american life the great american dream they already had that from their childhood in the first world war america actually lost the least and gained the most because they provided weapons to all the allied countries 
and very little of the war was fought on American territory. <clears throat> so America became very prosperous after the First World War. And that prosperity was received by the children of the people who fought in the First World War. So by the 60s, the First World War ended in 1944, by the 60s, these were kids were in teenage. And they had everything that previous generations had dreamt about and they are frustrated with it. They felt there has to be something more in life. And it was that time that Srila Prabhupada came and <clears throat> the mood at that time was to, uh, re uh, to reject everything. It is said about these hippies, they were rebels without a cause and rebels without a pause. <laughs> <laughs> this is rebelling, 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 rebel against economy, rebel against politics, rebel against education, rebel against family, rebel against everything. And when Srila Prabhupada came to them and he spoke, you know, he gave them philosophical reasons for their rebellion. Okay, what is wrong with the education? What is wrong with the society? What is wrong with the politics? That is based on the ignorant bodily conception of life. The life's ultimate goal is spiritual. So they had already rejected everything. Prabhupada says in a lecture that the hippies had already done Sarva Dharma and Parittaj. <laughs> I taught them how to do Maam Ekam Sharanam Raja. <laughs> so, in this way, when Srila Prabhupada pre spoke in the West, he just, uh, the at that time in America, the hippies, they're just the receptive audience for Prabhupada's mood and mission. And many of them took up and they had rejected the world and f at that time, practicing bhakti, becoming a devotee meant moving into the temple. Even if one got married, even if one was a householder, still they lived in the temple. So, the idea of practicing bhakti was, the world out there is big, bad, material world, filled with maya, and the temple is the place where there is Krishna, and we move into the temple. And anybody who did not move into the temple, they are considered not a very serious devotee, not even a devotee also. So that's why for many generations, uh, for, uh, for quite a few years, when Indians initially started coming to the temples, the Americans thought that, the American followers of Prabhupada, they thought that these Indians, they are not devotees. Because they were trying to preach to them, come on, move into the temple. And Indians had worked very hard, for, come from India to America, and they wanted to have, have their career. They also wanted to have dharma, but they wanted to have their career. So, for many years, these Indians were coming to the temple, coming to the temple, but the Americans, they did not pay much attention. They are not going to become devotees. Saravindra so Sarup Prabhu, one of the Prabhupada's senior disciples, writes that, you know, if these Indians who were coming to our temple, who were coming to our temples regularly, if anybody had done a religious survey and asked them, which religious group do you belong to? They would have said Hare Krishnas. But if somebody had asked us, are these Indians your people? He said, no, they are not Hare Krishnas. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a mismatch between what was the expectation of people living in the temple and what was the expectation of people who were outside and who were coming regularly. After Srila Prabhupada departed from the world and for a variety of reasons, the whole approach of living in the temple and rejecting the world, many devotees found it unsustainable. It was, uh, one reason was it was became financially itself unsustainable. The movement primarily was sustained by book distribution. But somehow the devotees, during Srila Prabhupada's times, uh, they, they misunderstood or misapplied Prabhupada's instruction and they started using less than exemplary or ethical means to distribute books. They tried to force people to give them some, something, tell them something about the book, which is not there in the book also. <laughs> and then they tried to sell them the book. Oh. So after there was a there was a reaction to that after some time, and uh, in fact uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj who led the Radhamudar bus party, which distributed thousands and thousands of books, he at one time eventually in the 1980s early 1980s, he actually in the Dallas area he told devotees to stop distributing books, because distributing books itself, the book distributors were seen as symbols of these cultist Hare Krishnas who try to steal your money uh, by unethical means. So then even we were distributing a lot of books in airports, 
and that couldn't be done because the airports uh, they cut off access for us not just for us in general for everyone so then at that time the main source of income for the temples was books because in india there is a culture of uh, giving uh, donations to the temples and through that temples are maintained but here there was no culture like that in fact here in america also there are several temples where there are western brahmachari ashrams and those brahmachari ashrams uh, actually the congregation is not maintaining the ashram the temple is not maintaining the ashram the brahmacharis they distribute books and distributing books whatever lakshmi they get by that they are maintaining themselves so that ethos of uh, donations leading to the maintenance of the temple that didn't come up because they were among the hippies uh, there were very few people who were well educated with respectable jobs and indians had not yet become so committed so then what to do many of the devotees found that they couldn't continue in the temple because the temple didn't have service the temple couldn't support them and they didn't have any degrees so then they had to go back into the world and take up some various what a kind of job they would get so the <clears throat> the model of bhakti that the bhakti means moving into the temple and practicing bhakti that way that for many devotees it was not very sustainable now uh, this was not the only model of bhakti that shri prabhupad himself taught if we see when shri prabhupad was in india he saw that indians when even before prabhupad went to america indians were not very interested in becoming serious followers we know that prabhupad also speech spoke for 40 years but nobody became a very committed follower if you see even after prabhupad went back to india not many people became committed followers if we see among the first generation leaders of our movement how many of the leaders are indians and even those who are indians many of them were introduced in the west and then they became uh, devotees there and prabhupada told them to go to india and speak so there were many reasons for that <clears throat> but more importantly prabhupada adapted to their needs so when when prabhupada came back with his western followers to india it was primarily the cultural nationalism of indians which inspired them to come to isko oh you know these western people they ruled us for so long now our culture is being followed by them so prabhupad saw that and prabhupad was ready to engage them at that level so he encouraged them to become life members in fact <clears throat> one devotee was telling that he was a personal servant of prabhupad and he said prabhupad in a day when he was in india he would sometimes go to the house almost 10 12 people's houses morning he would finish the bhagavatam class in the temple and just go one house stay for some time take a little prasad give a little talk talk uh, talk with a few people move on to the next house next house next house initially the you know, first spiritual master comes to the city wherever programs are there we want to go and attend the programs and the devotees also wanted to go to all the programs but soon they found that prabhupad's pace was such that they couldn't keep it up so then eventually they broke into two batches you know one batch would go with prabhupad say after 9 o'clock he would start and they would go till around 2 o'clock 3 o'clock and then when they then this whole batch would come back tired so <laughs> going to 2 3 4 5 places and then another batch would come and they would go from 3 o'clock till 9 o'clock to another place so prabhupad went and prabhupad in the, going to their house was many indians have that pious instinct sadhu should come to our house bless our house with their feet so prabhupad would do that and he would encourage them to become life members so now life membership means at one level no commitment the only commitment is they give some contribution and prabhupad uh, the books come in their temple in the house and they also can come and stay in the, our temples so the idea was prabhupad provided them facilities to grow in their spiritual life but prabhupad did not insist on that they were they were indian they were westerners who were initiated devotees and that was their connection of pride with iskon that was their identity you know we are i am a initiated person this is my name i had gone to meet one uh wealthy person and you know when people write on their name plates this is i am mbbs this phd or llb or whatever so this person on a name plate had written life member is con 
So, Shri Prabhupada presented it so expertly that this is an international organization and you can become a life member of an international organization. So, like some people say, you know, member of Rotary Club, Lions Club, like that, life member is gone. So, Prabhupada presented in such a way that people felt pride in that connection with our movement. So, we see Prabhupada, in one sense, offering two very distinct visions of connection with with Krishna. One is where you move into the temple and become full-time committed devotees, the grahasthas or brahmacharis, whatever. And the other is, you stay where you are, no commitment, just have a connection, positive connection with Krishna. And by this, uh, Prabhupada created a lot of positive vibes for the Krishna consciousness movement in India. And then, it was in the 80s that um, devotees started evolving the concept of congregation preaching. The congregation preaching means that people stay at their houses and every week we have a program at their place. And they can come to the temple, they will come to the temple once a week, but the whole idea is they are never expected to move into the temple. That's not the primary expectation. That you stay where you are and you practice bhakti and grow. And that's how the preaching started blossoming. And if you see during Prabhupada's times, Iskon had very few Indians actually. The lecture of Shri Prabhupada in 1971, I think, or maybe 1970. Prabhupada says, this movement is from India and I am the only Indian in this movement. (laughs) 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 So, but now we see that things have changed and India is is the powerhouse of ISKCON in terms of the number of temples, the number of devotees, the number of books distributed. So, things changed because when devotees went to India and started preaching, initially Prabhupada's disciples, even in India, they had that model. You know, everything is illusion, just join the temples. But Indians were not ready to do that and Prabhupada did not expect the life members to do that. Just be with them. And then devotees gradually evolved the concept of congregation preaching and then devotees became committed. Now, for many Indians, dharma is an important part of their life. There are many Indians who are bhaktas but not sadhakas. They have some bhakti for Krishna, they will do some aarti, some puja and they, they have some, we could say some sincere emotion for Krishna. But they are not practicing sadhana bhakti. So, uh, in this con, that's why if a new person has come, we say bhakta so and so. We use that name. Actually at one level, say bhakta is a very exalted state. You know, who is a bhakta among us? But the idea is, somebody is a bhakta but that is just now becoming a sadhaka. Sadhaka means one starts practicing the disciplines which will help us to intensify our devotion. So many people, they have become sadhakas. In fact, thousands and thousands of people in India have grown towards becoming sadhakas. So now, <clears throat> when some of the devotees, say they were living in, the, in America, they were living in the temples, and then they, the temple just couldn't sustain them. Because book distribution collapsed, devotees tried various things, devotees tried to dist- uh, sell incense, sell painting, sell various things and try to maintain, but it was difficult. Because sometimes in some temples we had many, many devotees. And they were left at that time, some of the devotees felt let down. You know, we left everything for Krishna we, and then we are not being taken care of. And somehow, at that time some of the leaders, also they didn't have, uh, because they were also, we can't blame anyone, they were very new. The leaders also, movement also were 35, 40 years old. 30, 35 years old. So they told, don't worry, Krishna will protect you. Krishna will maintain you. And this created a lot of bitterness. So Radhanath Maharaj once was telling in a Ishtagoshti meeting, he says, at one level, yes, we can give devotees the faith that Krishna will protect them. But at another level, Krishna protects his devotees through his devotees. Krishna protects his devotees through his devotees. That means, he said, it is for us as devotees to assist each other and support each other. So if a devotee is sick, it is not that, you know, you know, just remember Krishna, Krishna will protect you. <laughs> now if it is a devotee is sick, we should see that this is an opportunity for us to do Vaishnava Seva. This is an opportunity for me to help this devotee. So that ethos of serving devotees, of helping devotees who are in need and creating systems by which devotees can be helped. So that they can 
sustainably practice bhakti so <clears throat> that is what radhanath maharaj focused on now he was preaching he was first in vrindavan where he was a pujari then he started preaching in america going to colleges he was significantly successful but then he was told to go to india and then in india he started developing the community he stopped given several talks on the counselor system one of the consistent themes he speaks in the counselor system is that we need to provide devotees whatever they need so that they can practice bhakti life long so the devotees need some emotional support devotees need some health care devotees need some say marriage help getting help in getting married devotees need some help in say some count, some guidance in life so there should be someone who provides them there should be some systems who provide them that and for that various systems were created i was once with his own jayapataka maharaj and he was giving he was ishta goshti says that actually if i look at my day when people come to meet me he said you know people come if i l- l- take a list of what all are the topics which people talk with me about he said that you know people talk about uh, their family problems financial problems health problems management problems he said philosophical questions is something less than 1% i talked during the day <laughs> i'm a spiritual master but that's that's not what people come to talk with me about most of the time so why is this because uh, at that time at least these are needs which devotees have if i have some family issues i have some health issues i need someone to talk with and if there is no system to take care of it then everything is expected to be taken care of by the spiritual master and then it is very difficult for the spiritual master also to take care of all these things so then uh, for the sustainable practice of bhakti so I there is intensity in bhakti you know i want to practice practice very seriously which is very good but then we have to see at what level i can practice bhakti intensely say we can fast nirjal maybe once a year on uh, pandav nirjal ekadashi but if i told to fast nirjal throughout the year that will be impossible for us we can't do it or even if i told we can fast on ekadashi without grains once a fortnight we are told life long to live without grains it will be difficult so um, there is each one of us has to find how we can practice bhakti sustainably bhakti as one prabhu pada sahib was telling that when prabhupada was there at that time the mood was such that you know within a few days we are going to take the hari krishna is going to take over the world and in a few days after that we are all going to become pure devotees <laughs> so they just exp- they just expected such high things you know and the movement was also spreading very rapidly and at least in the initial days of bhakti the transformation that happened also dramatic you know we have some bad habits just they go away so it is dramatic transformation dramatic expansion of the movement so the expectation was that things will ch- go on dramatically changing like this but over a period of years the changes do keep happening but they become a little more subtle they are inside the purification becomes more gradual it's not so Im- immediately visible so if we are depending on these dramatic changes either in our heart or dramatic changes in the outer world as the inspiration for our practice of bhakti then we may not get that so we need to have proper systems by which we can have sus- motivation to sustainably practice bhakti in the upadesha amrit uh, nectar of instruction prabhupad says that the krishna consciousness movement is sustained by the six fold loving exchanges among devotees he speaks in the dadati pratigrahanaati purport guhya makha chi puchati that the six fold loving action giving gifts taking gifts speaking our heart hearing others speak their heart offering prasad taking prasad this is the way the krishna consciousness movement is nourished that means is once we understand that yes krishna is my goal is worldly entanglements i have to give them up but krishna is a very long way away and i have to live my whole life till i get to krishna many times if people are facing problems If somebody is having a lot of trouble and they come to a preacher i have this problem yes you know this world is dukha and you'll have problems only <laughs> <laughs> well that is true at a philosophical level but at a practical level that is not the way 
the culture was you know arjuna is crying in tear is tear at the start of the bhagavad gita and krishna speaks the bhagavad gita to console him by the end of the bhagavad gita arjuna is composed so krishna doesn't tell arjuna oh you know my message is that this world is dukhalem you already realized it so no need for me to speak any message and this world is dukhalem yeah? but we have to help people find a way to live as well as possible in this world and to move out of this world the moving out of the world to attain krishna's abode is the ultimate goal uh, which is extremely important but in the intermediate how are we to live so creating systems for that was extremely important so uh, the counselor system is where basically whatever name we have we are counselor mentor guide whatever we call it the point is is a facility by which there can be six fold loving exchanges among devotees because we have a big devotee community uh, sometimes we talk about souls who are lost in the material world and we get them to krishna yes that is true but sometimes there can be souls lost in krishna's movement also <laughs> <laughs> especially if we go to dhams and we are not we just go on ourselves and there are so many people so many strange ideas they are in the dham but actually their consciousness is just gone here there everywhere so even in the association of devotees we need some direction we need some purpose we need some urgency so we that has to be provided as much as possible through structure and if we consider that famous metaphor of the drop of water going uh, of of water going towards the ocean which is an upanishadic metaphor which is used by the impersonal to talk about how we merge but the vaishnavas use it to talk about how the consciousness flows towards krishna so now all of us have some spiritual urge we all want to grow spiritually but for most of us our spiritual urge is like a small trigger it is not like a powerful river so one trickle if it is on the top one small trickle is there it is on top of a mountain for it to reach the ocean is very difficult but if many such triggers come together then they become a tributary when the tributaries come together they become a river and that river moves towards the ocean so like that the association of devotees and a forum where devotees can associate nicely with each other that is that is what helps the trickles of water to become a river and then they can move towards krishna collectively so <clears throat> this whether it is as a council system or whether it is a say a hospital where the purpose is there are many devotees who have become doctors or many doctors have become devotees rather so what do they do either they have their own independent practices or they work in a hospital with somebody else but if they come together then their material life and their spiritual life can be harmonized that we have to anyway do our jobs but if you could do the jobs in a setting where we can have association of devotees then it becomes the material and the spiritual becomes harmonized the purpose of varnashram is not so much to divide society into varnas brahman kshatriya vaishya shudra the purpose that division also is meant for a purpose that purpose is to help the material life become as harmonious as possible with the spiritual life to so somebody the brahmanical orientation and give them a brahman engagement in the service of krishna so basically create systems by which devotees can move towards krishna systematically so similarly uh, there was the marriage bureau or the marriage board whatever again with the word nowadays there are so many portals which are available for devotees who want to uh, who want to pursue the grihastha ashram but earlier it was not there most devotees how did they get married initially prabhupad did that and prabhupad was a pure devotee he would just tell this boy this devotee this boy you two of you get married <laughs> and you know he expected at one level that that the system of arranged marriage was the elders tell and you now you get married to this and and they come together and they live but he found that for the western people it is not like that and prabhupad at least he knew the devotees some disposition he would talk about it but some of them then some of the prabhupad disciples had to follow that some temple president said you you get married to this and they would get married and just couldn't sustain it not anyone's fault but they couldn't sustain it so there has to be a system created by which people can have this particular need fulfilled in a proper way so through this the whole practice of bhakti 
can be done in a sustainable way. There is, we all need to go towards Krishna, which is our life's ultimate goal. But while going there, there are various needs that we have. And those needs cannot be denied or rejected. At the same time, to fulfill those needs, we don't have to go away from Krishna. So if somehow we could create a system by which those needs are fulfilled within the devotee community. Then we can move towards Krishna more easily. So that is the whole idea of providing for practicing bhakti sustainably. And that vision has caught up in various ways by which devotees can move towards Krishna steadily. Now, after Maharaj was there for almost 10-15 years in India, he started coming more intensely in 1986-87. He's coming before that, but that time he started saying more. Then he was there for, he spent a lot of time personally being with devotees, spending time with devotees. And at a personal level, Maharaj is always very, very sweet and very humorous. <laughs> so that's what devotee was telling me, that in the early days when they would have programs, there were only 10-15 people, 1987-1988. So <clears throat> Maharaj would meet with everyone after the program. And all the Prabhus, Maharaj would meet them and give them a nice big hug. So once, a couple came for the program for the first time. So they, they were new, they didn't know anything. So both of them, after that, they saw everybody coming in line to meet Maharaj. So then the, the Prabhu, he came and met Maharaj. And Maharaj hugged them. And his wife didn't know anything, she also came forward to Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> so Maharaj just gently folded his hands. Mataji, I am not so advanced. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Maharaj at a personal level is very int very intimate. I was doing some proofreading for Maharaj for one of his books, Journey with, uh, Journey Home actually. Journey Within also I did some work. Journey Within was actually that time called Yoga of Love. Then they changed the name because Journey Home became a brand name to continue that theme with journey with it. So then my, we did the whole book. So I was working for almost 15-20 days, first when I was in Pune, and I came to Mumbai and stayed there with the Maharaj for 10-15 days, for, for one week almost, and did all the editing. So I had given many suggestions to Maharaj. Maybe you could add this example or this or that. Maharaj was very open about that. So then when I gave all the suggestions, I sent my mail. So when I came to Mumbai, I met Maharaj afterwards. Maharaj told me, your suggestions are very good. Now, incorporating your suggestions is your karma. <laughs> he said, take it all and implement it to see whether it's done properly or not. So then I did that and then we finished everything. And then one night Maharaj said, told me that it was around 10 o'clock, that tomorrow I'm planning to send this book to the publisher. So before that, can you do one final proofreading? That is a 300 page book. <laughs> uh, so that's 10 o'clock at night I said okay Maharaj I'll do it so that whole night I was awake I was trying to do proofreading and while I was doing proofreading at night I just fell asleep and crashed against my computer screen and cracked my computer screen <laughs> but somehow I managed to do that the next morning and next morning Maharaj was in a very cheerful mood Maharaj told me that now I'm doing proofreading we don't want to touch my file so you make all the changes in your file and tell me and I will incorporate all the changes. So at one point, Maharaj said that, uh, I, there was a spelling Bhakti Siddhanta. So there was Bhakti Siddhanta, S, <coughs> the, there was a double D over there. So there was one D, uh, there was one letter that was missing over there. Bhakti Siddhanta. So B B H A K T I S I D D H A N T. So there's only one D over there. So I told Maharaj, we have to put one D over here. Excellent. I said, you pass the test. I said, I just looked at Maharaj. Said, what do you mean, Maharaj? He says, I had left out that D to check whether you'll find it or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know. I was just looking at Maharaj. Maharaj says, don't worry. I was just joking. <laughs> Now till this day I don't know whether it was joking or it was intentional. <laughs> so, Mahaj at a personal level is very warm, very, very, very 
very loving, very jolly. At the same time, so historically, Maharaj felt the need to fulfill Prabhupada's instruction or Prabhupada's wish to spread Krishna consciousness once again, or revive Krishna consciousness in America. In America, the ethos changed completely. The counterculture was a phase which just got over. And after that, our movements uh, widespread also went down. So there is... Now, ISKCON is quite strong in India, but in America also, but it is mostly filled with Indians. So some devotees say that there is the Hinduization of ISKCON mm, or Indianization of ISKCON. Some devotees say it's not even Indianization, it's Teluguization of ISKCON. <laughs> <laughs> so, so whatever it is, anybody who is coming to Krishna's movement, that is wonderful. Uh, but at the same time, um, there is an important, Prabhupada wanted that you know, whichever country we are in, the people of that country also become devotees. So then around 2004-2005, when Bhakti Dhrit Maharaj pushed Maharaj to write out his own story, and he wrote that book eventually, from that time, Maharaj saw that book as a way of reaching out to Western people. In the Western world, uh, there is now a whole era is of very great skepticism. In the pre-modern times, people believed in scripture, whether it's Bible or Vedas or Quran or whatever. In the modern times, science replaced scripture and science became the authority. If science says something, it must be right. In the postmodern times, people lost faith even in science because there are nuclear weapons which were developed and there are many scientific theories which were considered very bedrock truths were proven to be questionable. So now people do use technology a lot, but they don't see science as a source of final knowledge. They use the products of science as technology, but there's not like an uncritical faith in science also. So then that doesn't mean people have developed faith in scripture. The postmodern age means there is neither faith in science nor faith in scripture. There is then what? There is faith only in experience. That means if something feels good to me, I will do it. If something works for you, tell me. If you say this is the truth, no, I'm not interested in that. Broadly, outreach can be in three ways. It can be prescriptive, normative and descriptive. Prescriptive means like a doctor gives a prescription. Do this, don't do this. So that, in today's world, it doesn't work at all. Now, who are you to tell me this? Normative means, this is right, this is wrong. Okay? On what basis? Okay, according to your scriptures, but why should I believe your scriptures? So, some other religious scriptures say something different. So then, descriptive means, this is what I do, and this is why I do it. So this approach works, because people want to see something that works. Nobody can live completely without faith. But they want, don't want to put faith in any authority. So example is given for this postmodern I world. You know, if there is a, say, a middle-aged couple who has been married for about 25 years and they're giving some guidance to some young couples who are about to get married or just newly married. So now if they say, we have been happily married for the last 25 years, and the young couples will say, yeah, yeah. They will be eager to hear. So we, we would like to share how we made it work. Yes. They want to hear. But if the same couple say that, no, we have been married for the last 25 years and anybody who divorces, they are going to go to hell. Then the postmodern people will say, you go to hell first. <laughs> we don't care for you. So anything that is presented as a dogma, this is what you have to do, this is the right thing, that doesn't work. So when I read the journey home for the first time, the Maharaj knew I was also used, I also used to write, I published BTG, I had written a few books. So Maharaj asked different devotees for their feedback about it. What do you think about the book? So I told Maharaj, Maharaj, the story, all the stories are very adventurous. What I like about the book the most is the tone. So in this in this book, you are not writing as a as a teacher speaking from the Vyasa. You are not you are writing as a friend sharing his experiences. So Maharaj said, Yes, this is the this is the tone that you need for Western audiences. And he said that India is also becoming westernized. 
if you learn to write this in this tone then you can reach both western and westernized indian audiences so at that time i started exploring what is this but the, if you see the whole journey home is not prescriptive or normative it is descriptive so through the descriptive tone many many people earlier who thought that is hari krishna are very narrow minded sectarian self righteous kind of people no you know so maharaj told me that journey home is my way of glorifying shri prabhupad he said many of my god brothers have written books about shri prabhupad a <coughs> full book is devoted to their experiences with prabhupad and he said his way is that he said that so this those those now this is i am paraphrasing in my words what maharaj said that those glorifications are mostly for insiders or people who want to become insiders you know how oh i met prabhupad this was so wonderful this was so wonderful this is so wonderful so people who are already followers of prabhupad or who are considering becoming followers of prabhupad for them to hear about prabhupad's glory is wonderful but <clears throat> for people who are just broadly spiritual but they are not interested in necessarily following prabhupad so then for them in a subtle but very powerful way okay, what he shows is okay if they read maharaj's book they say he's a serious spiritual seeker he's ready to give up the whole world in search of god but then he goes to all these teachers now many of the teachers whom maharaj has talked about in his books in a mundane sense some of them may be much more well known than prabhupad also but maharaj went to all those teachers but then eventually surrendered to prabhupad that means he found prabhupad more inspiring than all of them so this is his way of glorifying shri prabhupad in a non exclusivist way exclusivist way means you know, this is right and everything else is wrong but non exclusivist means yes they are all good but i found this the best and this way is the way actually we can reach to a lot of people if we try to stand out you know we are right and everybody else is a deviant everybody else is diluting contaminating distorting then what happens if we try to stand out we are left out so you people are sectarian we don't want anything to do with you but if we try to belong is yes, they are all good and we are also practicing spirituality we also sharing spirituality if we try to belong we stand out why because we have serious sadhana we have very sound philosophy we have many dedicated devotees so this whole approach that we try to stand out everyone else is uh, is deviant and we stand out that is the carry over from the rejection ethos of the 1960s the whole world is bad and we have to become devotees we are good but that was not the only way the life members they didn't become devotees but prabhupada said they were good because they were appreciate you of krishna they were contributing krishna in their own way so when we try to stand out i am the best then we are left out sometimes i was at an interfaith meeting in australia so i was talking with the devotees after the meeting and we had a very good meeting and then they were telling that somehow in the past the in australia we had a lot of negative publicity but now things have changed so what happens sometimes we devotees uh live in a state of self congratulatory isolation self congratulatory isolation means what no i pat myself on the back shabash well done well done so i think i am good and everyone else is bad but that mood is comes off as very egoistic for others and it alienates a lot of people so the mood of journey home was that not in a way of rejecting everything else to surrender to krishna but rather accepting this is good but that is the best and that's how you bring people to prabhupad's feet and krishna prabhupad krishna lotus feet and this book had a uh, this so maharaj saw this book as a launching pad for connecting with western audiences in the west people are interested in spiritual individuals not in religious institutions they feel religious institutions they have had bad experiences with the church and many things that happened in the church i don't want to be associated with the institution but i am interested in spiritual individuals so when maharaj is presented if he is presented to western audiences he goes to yoga kra, yoga people yoga kra, he presents himself not as a 
iskon guru but as the author of journey home that positioning is important because then people feel oh this person also went on a spiritual journey had his own experiences and is going to share some wisdom people are interested in that so many doors which were never reached by a devotee audience devotees before devotee leaders before have now been opened by this so maharaj feels that and i met him last year in chicago he was telling that the same amount of time i spend in new york in london or in mumbai uh, in london the devotees can organize much bigger programs than what they can in new york and in mumbai they can organize even bigger programs in any talk maharaj gives there will be more than 1000 people there for the talk sometimes several thousand but maharaj said that prabhupad said new york is the most important city in the world prabhupad said america is the country which is the most influential in the world so he says i want to do something in america that's why in a sense he could be resting on his laurels he could be just uh, in india i can just everybody arranges programs for him and he gives classes and thousands of people come for his classes but even now he he is spending more and more time in america trying to reach out to americans and sometimes it is possible that we may feel that we don't get personal association with the spiritual master and that is something with not just um say devotees in america feel even devotees in india feel even indian leaders also feel that sometimes but <clears throat> maharaj's mood is that now whatever is the most effective way in which prabhupad can be served in prabhupad mission can be served that is where he wants to focus his energy and yes there will always be issues which need to be resolved but if uh, but our own issues if we learn to resolve we grow it is not that we don't have any support system at all we have some support systems we have a good devotee community around us we have our god family we have other devotees to whom we can connect so but for the western audiences if for them to connect with indians is very difficult for them to see indians especially in their land as teachers is not so easy they may accept them as colleagues but as teachers is very difficult so for them to come to krishna that's where maharaj is focusing his energy quite a bit and uh, generally when we live in a community even in india it's not that maharaj is there everywhere for many of for most of the first decade of my bhakti i was in pune and all the pune and Nas- mumbai are just 3 4 hours but maharaj would barely come once a year or once in 2 3 years to pune also we would go sometimes but even when we go to mumbai we hardly get to associate with maharaj much so <clears throat> if we consider the krishna consciousness movement to be like a big university where we all get spiritual knowledge then our spiritual master is like the head of department of one uni- one department and this is this university prabhupad is the principal and prabhupad is the founder and there are many departments over here so our spiritual master is like the <coughs> head of one department and say if you get into this university and we doing a doing our phd over there so for doing the phd the usually the head of department has to sanction you know okay this person can be admitted into the college and after that depending on the specialization depending on the situation the phd student will work with a particular phd guide and that phd guide may not be the head of department at all and most of the actual learning on the ground for the student will happen with through the phd guide now both the phd guide and the head of department have the same purpose that is to educate the students but specifically for particular students the channels will be different so similarly if we consider <clears throat> in the broad movement, broad institution educational institution for providing spiritual knowledge the spiritual master is the head of the department and the local community leader is like the phd guide so most of our spiritual connection is with the local community and the local community leader so wherever maharaj goes that he if, if from any community devotees go and talk with maharaj maharaj tells them you know you please the local community leader if you serve him if you please him i'll be pleased so it is, we have to see that there is individuality and there is commonality this individuality means each spiritual master is individual they have their own personality they have their own inspiration they have their own 
uh, areas of emphasis but then all the gurus are having one purpose this commonality is the purpose is to take us towards krishna so uh, the nature of the mind is that it always tends to be dissatisfied so whatever situation we are in we can look at what we have and be satisfied or we can look at what what we don't have and be dissatisfied so in when we are when if we are materialistic people we always look at material things oh this person has a bigger car than me this person has a bigger house than me and that makes us dissatisfied that is typical of the mode of passion now when we come to bhakti the mode of passion doesn't go away the mode of passion still stays and then we bring that dissatisfaction to bhakti also oh you know i don't have this i don't have that i don't have that i don't have a social of my spiritual master i don't have this this thing i don't have that thing i don't have that thing uh, i met in mayapur i met one devotee uh, he is he is from a country in europe you know one of the uh, countries which is in between russia the us sr block and their small country he says that in that whole country he is the only devotee <laughs> one devotee in the whole country it's not a very big country and he says that country is practically they, they have no veganism also it's almost everybody is a non vegetarian so you know if you consider what facilities we have and what that it's just one person in the whole country is still practicing bhakti so we can look at what we don't have and we can feel dissatisfied or we can look at what we have and we can be satisfied so satisfaction is not just a emotion we feel satisfaction is also a decision we make sometimes you feel satisfied yeah this is so good i feel satisfied after this but that feeling of satisfaction when it comes that is nice but satisfaction is also a decision that we make means we consciously choose to look at the things that are right in our life and based on that we can cultivate satisfaction so by the mercy of shri prabhupad and his dedicated followers all of us have facilities to grow in spiritual life wherever we are we may or may not have the personal association of a spiritual master but the the spiritual master is a very important uh, inspiration for the practice of bhakti but at the same time the spiritual master cannot practice our bhakti for us it is we who have to practice our bhakti once one a devotee asked um, one sanyasi he asked chandra boli maharaj he says you know prabhupad his chanting is so much more pure than my chanting so during japa instead of chanting 16 rounds can i hear prabhupad chanting for 2 hours <laughs> <laughs> so chandra boli maharaj said that prabhupad has already done everything for you at least you chant <laughs> so now we whatever we need for our spiritual advancement we have been provided and if it is not provided if we have a sincere desire to serve krishna it will be provided to us so rather than letting the mind become dissatisfied i don't have this i don't have that we focus on serving krishna and the common mission of the spiritual master of shri prabhupad will come through various shiksha gurus and we will get the guidance we will get the mercy and we will grow spiritually so the uh <clears throat> mood of i'll conclude with this point that the in every spiritual master has their own uh, inspiration of how they want to serve krishna say for example there are some spiritual masters their focus is to distribute a lot of books prabhupad wanted books to be distributed distribute a lot of books that's wonderful uh some spiritual master they feel yes you have to build big temples as many temples you can build that's nice some spiritual masters they feel that you know we should prabhupada had wrote so many books i should focus on writing books or translating books so different spiritual masters can have different focuses so <clears throat> once i was at a prabhupada vyas puja ceremony in radha gopinath temple and maharaj spoke beautifully about prabhupada sacrifice and prabhupada started starting krishna consciousness movement and then maharaj said uh, something that just felt i felt maharaj was revealing his heart he said that you know on this day what can we offer to prabhupad he said that all of us are the offering to prabhupad 
is we as a community practicing bhakti together we are the offering to prabhupada so again what maharaj focused on when he was in india one of if uh, one of his prime contributions is to build a community where devotees can cooperatively live together and can practice bhakti and move towards krishna so whichever community we are in if we try to um, harmonize with the mood of that and contribute to that then we will be also uh, harmonizing with the overall mood in which prabhupada maharaj wants to contribute to prabhupada's mission and we can grow towards krishna so <clears throat> for us the facility to serve krishna is always coming from the spiritual master through the various representatives so if we take that facility wherever we are we can advance if we have that facility but if we don't take the initiative and even when we are very close to the spiritual master we may not make much spiritual advancement so we take the inspiration from the spiritual master and move towards krishna by our steady practice of whatever facility steady practice of bhakti using whatever facilities we have so i'll summarize what i spoke i started by speaking about how the theme i spoke was on balancing between intensity and sustainability in the practice of bhakti and especially radha maharaj's contribution towards a culture of sustainable bhakti so his con started at a historically unusual moment when people rejected everything and moved into the temple but even during prabhupad's time when people when prabhupad went to india indians didn't have that mood so prabhupad accommodated them by creating life membership and you stay where you are but just have some favorable uh, attitude towards krishna and make some contribution and then when the devotees found that after prabhupad left they found that they could not practice that level of bhakti living in the temple then they start to find their own way to practice bhakti that's how the whole concept of congregation preaching emerged uh, in congregation preaching the idea is wherever devotees are that is where in whatever situation they are that is where they will practice bhakti and for their practice of bhakti whatever facilities are required we as the devotee community should provide that when devotee has certain need rather than telling them that krishna will protect you it is our responsibility that krishna protects his devotees through his devotees so we try to provide the system so that's how for for facilitating the six fold loving exchanges among devotees there is a counselor system for providing devotees a setting in which they can harmonize their material profession with their spiritual association there is a hospital or other projects like that for devotees to move forward gracefully in grahastha ashram there is marriage board so various other support systems that are required providing that so that devotees can practice bhakti sustainably lifelong that is what maharaj focused on doing in the other gopinath community and then once that community was reasonably well established then he felt that iskon is gone down in america one reason being that uh the whole ethos has changed people are not interested in rejecting the world and trying something new they just want to experience something so then maharaj wrote journey home which offers not prescriptive or normative spirituality but descriptive spirituality and through that he's been able to connect many many people who were earlier uh, who saw is called as very sectarian earlier and stayed away from it they are coming closer to krishna's movement so if we try to stand out we are left out but if we try to belong then we stand out and for us we consider the krishna conscious movement to be like a university our spiritual master like the head of department and our community leader like our phd guide so the mission is common for everyone so wherever we are if we try to serve in a harmonious way then we will grow spiritually rather than looking at what we don't have and feeling dissatisfied we understand that the essential spiritual ad- advancement comes not just by the personal association of the spiritual master it comes by our commitment to practice bhakti the spiritual master is meant to inspire us to give with that commitment but we can get that commitment from other sources also and if we get that and wherever we are we have been provided the facilities or we will be provided the facility by krishna's arrangement by which we can make steady spiritual advancement and ultimately attain prabhupada's and krishna's shelter thank you very much hare krishna Are there any questions or comments? One or two quickly. Yes, from. Hello, Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu, for a very, very thought-provoking class. Um, you mentioned in the beginning about uh, contextualization of instruction. Hmm. 
I guess a related thing which I wanted to ask is when we kind of strip humanity away from uh, from a particular spiritual personality, spiritual master or teacher. Um, it's um, to give an example. Uh, people, I have seen these discussions happening where people say, uh, "My guru knows everything about me, so." whatever I am doing is okay or he will say within my heart and in fact sometimes people also say within my dream and uh, it's like uh, and uh, it's like you strip the humanity he's a personality he's a human and we see even in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's past times Sanatana Goswami even though he's a manjri but then he was also having boils and things like that there's a human side to it also so instead of yeah. Going into that speculation of just ascribing completely spiritual dimension. Um, and I think Maharaj also once said, I am not Prabhupada. I am all different than being to one devotee he said mm -hmm. when he was in New York. So I want to understand how we can collectively educate okay. ourselves yeah. to understand there is a personality. We should understand to serve and not, it's not a complete black and white. Yeah. So how do we understand the humanity of the spiritual master that we don't uh, say ascribe omniscience to them and think that they just know everything and uh, they will tell us if we are doing something wrong in a dream or by some other means. <clears throat> the Mahabharata says and Prabhupada would often quote that Mahajano Yenagata Sapantha that we have to follow the path laid out by the Mahajanas. And if you look at Srila Prabhupada, he never operated on the platform of cleaving omniscience. No, he asked, he wrote letters, inquired from devotees and based on the information that he got, he chose courses of action. And in some cases, Prabhupada was misinformed. So, when Prabhupada was when the devotees were distributing books, one devotee wrote to, wrote to Prabhupada and said that the, dev the devotees are now going back to their karmi ways hmm, in the name of distributing books. Then Prabhupada said that they should always wear, they should always wear devotee clothes only. They cannot wear shirt pant. But then some other leaders told Prabhupada, if you start wearing dhoti kurta and saris, 50% of our book distribution will go down because people will not allow us to approach them only. And I said, no, we are not wearing hippie clothes. We are not going back. We are wearing respectable civil clothes. Oh, Prabhupada said, then that is okay. So there are many examples like this of those of those who lived with Prabhupada. He acted based on the information that he had. There could be a few occasions when Prabhupada read some devotee's mind, they told them exactly what they wanted. And we do not deny the capacity of the spiritual master to <coughs> exhibit paranormal knowing capacity. But that is not the normal operating uh, function, operating level of the spiritual master. That is not how the spiritual Prabhupada operated. And that is not the way we expect our spiritual master to operate also. So, Prabhupada would periodically ask for reports from devotees and based on that he would give them guidance. So for us also, uh, we understand that the pure devotees intention is pure. Mm -hmm. the pure is intention is always to glorify Krishna. But in the translation of that intention into action, the fact that they are in a human body, that will come into the picture. Now when a Hindu Mahasabha leader met Prabhupada in Mumbai and he said, Giraj Maharaj, when I last time met him in Carpentry, he told me this past time. He said that, Prabhupada, uh, this, this uh, Hindu, Hindu leader, Mahasangha leader, he said that, Swamiji, you pronounce Sanskrit verses in a very Bengali way. Now, he was from South Indian, South Indians have a very clear, very elegant way of pronouncing Sanskrit verses. Uh, so Prabhupada said, what can I do, I am a Bengali. <laughs> what do you expect from me? So, yes, the, it is not so much how the verses are pronounced, but how much the verses are realized. It is with war, how much when we are living the verses. So the intent, the transcendence of a pure devotee, is that the intent is always to serve Krishna. But in the translation of the intention into action, uh, the fact that they are in a human body will come into the picture. So a pure devotee will always want us to grow spiritually. But exactly how we will grow spiritually, uh, what we need to do for that, we may have to give them information for that. 
and Prabhupada did not tell anyone or did not write anywhere in his books that I will come in anyone's dream and give them instructions. He said, what I, what I wanted to give, I have given in my books. Now, it is possible that Krishna, can, that Prabhupada can come in our dreams, spiritual master can come in our dreams. But if you see Prabhupada also, it was not just because his spiritual master came in his dream that he took sannyas. He went and consulted his senior god brothers. And then he got the approval of senior god brother and then he took sannyas. So, we cannot say that the spiritual master cannot come in our dreams. But at the same time, to think that that is the way he will come to give me instruction. To expect that or to demand that, that is not to follow the example of the previous acharyas. If we have some issue, we need to consult them. And uh, if we need to give them some information based on which they can give us some guidance, it is for us to give them that. It is not that we, we if we start ascribing omniscience to the spiritual master in the name of reverence, I respect my spiritual master but then we also have to understand that Prabhupada many times said the spiritual master is not Krishna the only Krishna is omniscient spiritual master is servant of Krishna and in that sense the spiritual master is because it's being purely devoted to Krishna the spiritual master is empowered to serve Krishna empowered to infuse Krishna in the hearts of others but understanding that uh, Prabhupada is not Krishna and the Guru is not Krishna is very important. Now, we will never go into Mayavad by saying our Guru is Krishna. Hmm? Actually, Mayavadis go further and they say everyone is Krishna. Hmm? So, that is unlikely to happen in, Ma- in Vaishnavism that you say that everyone is Krishna. But having, but saying that the Guru is Krishna, that is a, that is a contamination that has happened many times in Vaishnavism. No, the Swami Narayans, they are actually very pure lies. They are Vaishnavas, but they have put Swami Narayan into the center. There is Ramanandis, who are the North Indian branches, North Indian followers of Rama, Ramanacharya. They divided into two groups because one of them said that Ramananda is Ram himself. Other said, no, he is a great devotee of Ram. So, in Vaishnavism, Mayavad creeps in by making Vaishnavas believe that their Guru is Krishna. So, we have to be careful about that also. Thank you. Yes, please. So, you were mentioning about Mara's contribution. The ginger water is there inside. Can you just get it? Ginger water is there. Okay. Can you get a glass? Yeah. I'll get a glass. You were mentioning about Mara's contribution by creating systems within the private popular community like council system. So, for Western preaching, are there any models that you can? So for Western preaching, are there any models that successful models that have worked out? Not exactly till now. Because Western outreach also has happened in different ways. In the past we distributed books, even now we are distributing books. But from the books to get people to become devotees, it's a long journey. So Maharaj is spending a lot of time and energy in Bhakti Center, no? And the idea is that, actually it's also following Prabhupada. There's a letter of Prabhupada, when he had come to New Zealand, he told that no, for the Western people, uh, there's no need for a temple. He said, just have a reading room mm-hmm. with a lot of books and give them the facility to read. In fact, when we got the LA temple, it was actually a church. And there, they had, like in, in church, they had those, uh, what do you call it? Mm-hmm. Chairs, not chairs, mm-hmm. benches, mm-hmm. pews. Mm-hmm. Pews, right. I just said, so they had the pews over there. And Prabhupada told them, keep the pews. And he said, let people come inside with their shoes. And he said, have the deities in some other room. But then what happened was, that's, that's, it was not possible, no other room was big enough to have the deities. Because people also want to come and take darshan. So then they had to do that over there. But Prabhupada himself was very insightful in doing what was required for attracting people to Krishna. So in the Western tradition, for people to accept deities becomes a little difficult. Because their tradition is very much against idolatry. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also, they are very strongly against sectarianism. 
so we say our philosophy is universal but externally we appear very sectarian you know a particular dress a particular kind of language a particular kind of food so we need to uh, present bhakti in a more universalist way so basically connect with them through yoga through meditation through wisdom and through music and then gradually get them to uh, to take up <coughs> bhakti in terms of say deity worship or other committed forms of practice so if you say if you consider this is like a main circle where people are practicing serious sadhana bhakti so for most western people to come to this circle is a big big leap so then we need a bigger concentric circle and this circle could be based on wisdom mm, so wisdom about how to live a spiritual life how to live a balanced life or it could be through yoga a lot of people interested in yoga it could be through kirtan so many people actually it was iskon that introduced kirtan to the western world raupada the first person who actually did kirtan in a public way but now kirtan has become such a big thing and iskon is nowhere in the kirtan scene actually so many other kirtaniyas are there very big there so somebody would they're trying to do that now rectify that so spiritual music kirtan that is something which they are interested in so we need to have some broader extension so in in 1960 70s the mood was of rejection spirituality as accepting after rejection of the world now the mood is of contribution now how can your spirituality make a constructive contribution either to my life or to society at large many people fancy themselves as activists they feel i want to be activist for some good cause so the govardhan eco village where we present eco friendly living that is a way where we can present people who have the zeal for environmental activism to come towards krishna so basically the circle of pure bhakti we need to extend further so that people find some accessible way to come towards krishna it that can be yoga that can be wisdom that can be meditation that can be music that can be eco friendly living through all these we can get people closer to krishna okay, so we uh, there is no one model which you can say has worked in a big way but in small ways each of these ways of connecting people with krishna has worked and attracted a significant number of people to at least become more favorable and more connected even if not committed at the level of sadhakas so thank you very much shila prabhupad ki jol sadhana swami maharaj ki gaur bhakt vrind ki tai gaur premanandi